Welcome to the Home Study Companion to the remarkable textbook Geometry A Guided Inquiry. This video introduction is about how to use the textbook and materials in the Home Study Companion package to get a high quality high school geometry course in a home school setting. I wrote a complete solution guide to every problem in the central and project sections of the textbook. I added a lot of commentary along with solutions, adding the kind of thing I would normally talk about in class. And I created nearly 300 demonstrations using the Geometer Sketchpad. I finished the geometry course in 2005. Geometry A Guided Inquiry is by far the best text I have seen in my 30 plus years of teaching. This is not a traditional geometry text. It covers all the traditional content and more, but it does not approach it in a traditional way. A traditional high school geometry course could be loosely described as a large collection of facts called theorems that are proved to be true based on a few simple facts called axioms that are assumed to be true. Many adults looking back on their high school geometry experience would describe it more as a course in logic than mathematics. This isn't all bad, but the logical framework dominates the whole course and actually limits it in some ways. What's missing is the connection between geometry and the rest of mathematics, from algebra through calculus. As traditionally taught, geometry doesn't quite fit. Geometry, a guided inquiry, is very different. It teaches geometry in the context of problem solving. The logic and the theorem proving are still there, but it does not dominate the course. Geometrical reasoning is developed as an essential part of mathematical reasoning. In my own experience outside the classroom, I've tackled many mathematical problems involving design and engineering. One recent example is figuring out how to mount solar panels on a roof in a south-facing orientation to catch the maximum sunlight throughout the day, even though the roof has a north-south roof line, so the flat surfaces faced east and west. The key insight involved seeing the solar panels as lying in a plane that intersects the two roof planes at an angle. The problem was solved in principle once I figured out the geometry of the layout. I finished up by figuring out all the angles using algebra and trigonometry, and extended it with a computer program to apply the method to roof lines in any orientation. But the key insight was geometrical. This interplay of geometry and algebra is common in science and engineering. Geometry really is an integral part of the mathematical problem-solving process. Geometry, a guided inquiry, is about mathematical problem-solving. Each chapter starts with a significant problem called the central problem for the chapter. You're not expected to be able to do the problem right away. That's not the point. Mathematics is about discovering ways or inventing ways to solve problems you've never seen before. It's like solving puzzles. The title of the text is Geometry, a Guided Inquiry. It's a guided inquiry. It's not like learning to swim by being thrown into the deep end of a pool. As you work to solve the central problem of the chapter, you'll be introduced to a whole cluster of helpful mathematical ideas that are useful in solving the problem. Each new idea you encounter is learned in the context of problem solving. That's the real purpose of this approach. The central problem is the glue that holds the chapter together. The facts you learn are not simply a laundry list of theorems. They are relevant, useful pieces of knowledge introduced at the point where they are needed to solve a problem. By the time you can solve the central problem, you will have learned something about problem solving and a lot of geometry along the way. Each chapter is open-ended. In a traditional classroom, all students would work through the central section and the chapter review problems at their own pace or in small groups within an overall time limit. Those who finished early would then work on the project section, extending what was covered earlier and applying it in other ways. The project section has some of the best material in the book, so don't rush past it as just an optional extra. I have added my own extension sections to several chapters to cover topics specifically mandated by the California State Standards. Keep in mind that this text was written back in 1970, and the standards weren't introduced until much later. 
so there is a little mismatch in the selection of topics. With the extensions added, the course is standards compliant, if you care about that. This is an excellent course with or without the extension sections. They are good topics, however, and I suggest you do include them. The central problem for the first chapter is called the shortest path. You are camped near a river. You are away from your camp, picking berries in the woods. You look back and see a spark land on your tent. You dump your berries, rush to the river, grab a bucket of water, run to the tent, and put out the fire. The question is, what is the shortest path? The answer is not at all obvious. The bigger question, of course, is how do you go about finding a solution to a new problem where you haven't been taught a method? So the first piece of real mathematics here is learning how to go about chipping away at a problem. In this case, you'll start by experimenting, drawing scale drawings, making measurements. What you're really doing is looking for insights. This stage of looking for insights is well served by technology. The text was written in the era of strictly pencil and paper, but the home study companion materials make heavy use of the geometer sketch pad as a tool for visualization and insight. Each chapter has its own unique focus. The second chapter deals with the problem of tiling the plane. What kinds of figures can be replicated infinitely to cover a plane? This is a beautiful context for learning about polygons, interior and exterior angles associated with polygons, and parallel and perpendicular lines. Chapter 3 is all about triangles, rigid triangular structures, and how much information is needed to completely determine a triangle. An extension to Chapter 3 introduces the idea of transformations and symmetry, using motion as a tool for geometrical reasoning. Chapter 4 is dedicated to proof. Proofs are used throughout the text, but here it is introduced formally. The raw material for these exercises in proof is the family of quadrilaterals, parallelograms, rhombuses, trapezoids, rectangles, squares, their sides, their angles, their diagonals, and all the distinctions between them. An extension to Chapter 4 goes a little further into the axiomatic method and gives the students a little flavor of the traditional approach so they will not be surprised in a standardized testing environment. Chapter 5 is about traditional compass and straight edge constructions, one of the most fun and hands-on parts of traditional geometry. The home study companion materials also connect this with computer graphics tools. Chapter 6 deals with areas and volumes. Area formulas for many common figures are reasoned out and derived, not just memorized. The extension section for this chapter touches base with a couple of formulas specifically mentioned in the California State Standards that were not included in the text. Chapter 7 covers the most famous theorem of them all, the Pythagorean Theorem. The theorem is derived in multiple ways and applied to a lot of different problems, including a new take on the shortest path of Chapter 1. Chapters 8 and 9 deal with one of the most important topics in the book, in my opinion, similar figures. These deal with scale models and proportionality. The authors of this text have the wisdom to see that the subject of proportionality among the linear area and volume dimensions of similar figures deserves a chapter all its own. This is a rich topic with a wide range of applications, from the amazing strength of ants to the weight of elephants. An extension section to chapter 8 gives the first introduction to trigonometry as an application of proportionality. Chapter 10 is all about circles with applications to other rounded shapes, spheres, cylinders, and cones. An extension section covers surface areas that satisfy another specific California standards requirement. Circles are elegant in their simplicity, but this turns out to be a huge topic. Here you meet one of the most famous numbers in mathematics, pi. You don't just memorize formulas for using pi you should come away with a good deal of understanding about this amazing number. As a bonus topic in the project section, you are even led through the process of calculating pi, much as Archimedes did thousands of years ago. The difference is, he did it by hand. You get to do it on a computer with spreadsheet software. Chapter 11 is where geometry meets algebra in a big way. Coordinate geometry. A line is a geometric concept. 
but a linear equation, such as you learned in Algebra 1, describes a line algebraically. It turns out that everything you do geometrically can be described algebraically, and vice versa, to the point where mathematicians typically don't make much distinction between algebra and geometry. Chapter 12 finishes the course with a wonderful chapter on the conic sections, ellipses, parabolas, and hyperbolas. These are the curves that describe the path of a baseball, the orbits of the planets, the shapes of optical surfaces in headlights and astronomical telescopes. It's a topic that traditional courses don't get to, but it's high in interest and rich in its connections with the rest of mathematics. One section of this chapter amazed me when I first taught from this text in the late 1970s. How is light reflected to a focus by elliptical, parabolic, or hyperbolic mirrors? I'd never seen this problem solved before without calculus. I learned the geometric solution from this text as I taught the course for the first time. The key insight? The Shortest Path Problem of Chapter 1. This elegant text comes full circle and ties it all together beautifully. I published the Home Study Companion for Geometry before screen capture video became widespread. I have since used video lessons as the basis for my Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 courses, and they have been both popular and effective. In its original form, the geometry course consisted of complete, worked-out solutions for every problem in the central and project section of the text. The textbook has answers to most of the problems in the review section, so I skipped over these. Over the years, I've gotten a number of requests for solutions for the review problems, so I decided to add a video solution guide for the review section of each chapter. After you've done the review problems, watch the videos and check your work. This has turned out to be a very appropriate addition because having an experienced problem solver walk you through the problem solving process can be quite helpful. Most important, treat the problems like puzzles. Mathematicians see their work as play. The breakthrough aha experience is a real natural high. If you have only seen mathematics as drudgery and getting the right answers to lots of boring, repetitive problems, you have not really experienced what motivates mathematicians and scientists to do what they do. Mathematics should be a joyful experience.